And if you weren't with us in the past, uh, we were just getting through Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is a radical chapter. I absolutely love Matthew chapter 16 and 17 and I guess the rest of the gospel too. But in Matthew chapter 16, some interesting things have occurred. So they went on a field trip. Jesus took the disciples not to the temple, but to a place called Bashan. And Bashan is like the enemy's territory. Bashan is the bad place. Caesarea Philippi is specifically where they went. And scholars believe they're at the, the base of Mount Hermon. Not at the top, but they're at the base of Mount Hermon in chapter 16, what we already went through. And it's at the base of Mount Hermon where scholars say that, whereas in the ancient world, it was the idea of ancient hell went down there, or Hades. And it's Jesus there at the Mount of Hermon where all the bad guys and bad stories and bad gods and all these bad things are supposed to happen. And Jesus is standing there saying, on this rock, I will build my church. It's a front hand, back hand to the enemy. He's telling the enemy, I can build my church anywhere I want to. In fact, I'm going to turn your throne into a tomb, Satan. I'm in charge. It's Jesus proclaiming that he is God. So that was a powerful chapter, chapter 16. You remember in chapter 16, you also have Peter, Peter making the good confession that Jesus is both Messiah and also the son of the living God. That's a powerful chapter. He was bold. He spoke it out. He did it. It was a more specific statement of identity, and Peter wasn't afraid to go deeper, and this time it paid off. But Matthew chapter 16, a lot of you notice this because we didn't preach to this point. Matthew chapter 16 ends in a strange way. It's very odd. Jesus had been standing in this pagan area at the base of Mount Hermon, most likely, and he was proclaiming war and victory at the same time, but then he followed it up by saying that he must die at the hands of the religious fakes. Who thinks that that was like kind of a buzzkill moment where there was like this peak, and you're like, man, this is awesome, and then Jesus is talking about his death, and you're like, that doesn't line up. Jesus, that doesn't fit very well with this whole victory thing you were just talking about. And then the very end of the chapter, Jesus says, some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That is an interesting way to end, isn't it? And I didn't teach on that yet because chapter 17 is where we get to see it. So if you have a Bible, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 17. That's where we're going to be today. Some standing here are about to see the coming of the glory of the king and his kingdom. What is about to happen in chapter 17 is going to echo a lot of Old Testament sentiments, a lot of things that are going to be grabbed from the Old Testament to show that Jesus is who he said he is. Matthew 17, we're at verse 1. And here's what it says. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as snow, or white as light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Oops. That was a mistake. I don't know if you caught it, guys, but that was a mistake. We'll we'll keep going here and come back to that. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. All right, pause right there for a second. Actually, no, let's, let's go a little further. I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Now we can pause right there. They saw no one except Jesus. That's actually an important point. And I wanted to end on that line right there to pause. My desire, how do I pray for America? And I do pray for America. Who else prays for America? I pray for the world. I pray for mission. I pray for America too. But when I pray for America, I pray that America 
would fall on its face like dead men, rising only to see only Jesus. That is the prayer. There's so many distractions. Who agrees with me? Who's sick of the distractions? Oh, come on, church, fire up a little bit. I mean, I'm real sick of it. I'm sick and tired of the distractions. I'm sick and tired of the distractions in people's home, on their TV, on their phone. You know, your phone is such a device, isn't it? It's such a device. It's such a distraction sometimes. Sometimes it's a great tool. Like, I need a calculator almost every day, it seems like. That's awesome. But, but I don't need all the trash that seems to come through via the phone. There's so many distractions, and I just wish that we could fall down. I wish the Church of America could fall down like dead men and rise to only see Jesus. Lord Jesus, that's my prayer. Lord Jesus, clear the clutter from our eyes. Amen. Clear the clutter from our eyes, Lord. Scholars tell us again, this high mountain was likely the same one, Mount Hermon, that we had talked about before. Jesus and the disciples had perhaps spent some time at the bottom of the mountain before by the place called the, the so-called gates of Hades or hell. And now, He gets the three of them, they ascend to the heights with Jesus on the mountain where the pagans say that Zeus was in charge. That's what the pagans said. And some other deity. But here, God chooses to shame the enemy again, turning old folklore stories and religion into dust. You have to understand what Jesus is doing here makes a lot of sense to them to the people who lived in that day. And so when he takes him to the peak of this high mountain, there's all these rumors and there's false religion, there's ideas of who owns this mountain. Jesus takes him to the top and he's showing them actually there's nobody else up here. It's just me. I'm in charge. The king of the world, as it were. Peter, James, and John all see Jesus, Moses, and Elijah in this vision and Peter being like starstruck, I think that's what it is. Have, who's ever met a celebrity before, aside from me? Yeah, but uh, who's ever met, yeah, okay, you've met a celebrity before? Who was it? Uh, I got, I got a book really? Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. Okay, so you met a celebrity before. Sometimes when you do a celebrity, you, you meet a celebrity, maybe you get kind of starstruck. This is Peter's starstruck moment. He's like, Moses and Elijah, and Jesus, and he doesn't know what to say, and his foot kind of goes in his mouth a little bit. So he says, Jesus, you get a tabernacle or a shelter, and Moses, you get one, and Elijah, you get one. (laughs) Peter has accidentally made a statement that Jesus is just an equal among the other prophets. Do you understand the mistake that Peter made when he said, I'll build three shelters, and each one of you gets one? How special is that, Jesus? No, he's just put his foot in his mouth. Moses and Elijah, if you don't know uh, the Old Testament very well, Moses and Elijah, they're heavy hitters. They're big deals in God's kingdom. Moses was the guy who helped deliver Israel from Egyptian Pharaoh, and, and he received the Ten Commandments from God for the people of Israel. He was a huge figure for the Jews. Elijah was a prophet who was known for great signs and wonders and words of truth. He was kind of the prophet of kings at times. Peter just offered to build three shelters because he's mistakenly seeing them all as equals. This was a problem. This is also where you'll find so many pastors and leaders. Where's my coordinators at? Raise your hand real tall. If you're a coordinator or board member in this room, just raise it real tall. This is why so many leaders... In the church, love Peter. It's because he's incredibly relatable. He is. He's incredibly relatable. He does great and he does terrible on the same page, in the same chapter, or sometimes in the same paragraph. (laughs) Yeah, he's relatable. Think of it. Sometimes Peter is the best of the 12 and sometimes he's the worst of the 12. He has the faith to walk on water when Jesus calls him onto the sea. And he has the weakness to see the waves and sink like the rock that he is. He is accurate when he declares that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, only to be harshly scolded not five minutes later when he tries to stop Jesus from completing his mission. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter is the first guy to whip out his pistol and blast a guy. 
It wasn't a, it was a pistol, it was a sword. All right? Some of you guys are like, nah, it wasn't a gun, I've read my Bible. No, but he's the first guy to whip out a weapon and he only gets an ear. He cuts off an ear of one of the guards and then what happens? Jesus says, Peter, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, put it away. I was like, man, Peter probably just felt like, when can I get a win? Just a solid win. I just, I'm trying, Lord. I sharpened my sword for this. I was ready. And soon after, he denied Jesus altogether for a few days of darkness, only to be reinstated when he sees Jesus again and he runs to him and he longs to be with Jesus. Peter often resembles the, the good parts and the bad parts of being a disciple and a follower of Jesus. And I think leaders, I think you probably relate to him to some degree. He's a complex person. But understand this, when Peter says, I'll build three shelters, it wasn't totally an intelligent offer. See, he was probably thinking in this visionary experience, he was probably thinking that this, uh, this vision, what he was seeing, was some sort of fulfillment. Uh, a lot of scholars say that he thought it was the fulfillment of something called Feast of Tabernacles. That he thought, oh, this is a big deal and this is gonna fulfill something, so we need three shelters because that's what we do at Feast of Tabernacles. He thought it maybe was something like that and he's jumping ahead, but he's missing the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest, however that phrase goes, I forget. <laughs> he's missing it. He, th he thinks it's about deliverance from Rome. He's got Rome on the mind. He's got enemies on the mind. So he sees the three people and he thinks the three shelters and he think he's thinking fulfillment of Israel in a very physical sense, but he's missing a spiritual reality. Who knows that we're still in danger of doing that? We can be so physically minded, we can be so horizontally minded that we miss an eternal perspective. Peter's kind of missing it right here. And that's why the next scene needed to happen. See, Peter, James, and John needed to know that someone greater than Elijah had arrived. A, great, uh, a person greater than Moses was among them. So it says a bright cloud overshadowed, overshadowed them, and that sounds kind of creepy. Wait, think about this. The, the, the shadow, Peter is still speaking. He's still throwing his recommendation out there. And a bright cloud comes around and they can't see each other and the, the brightness is bright to their eyes and they, they fall down like dead men. And can I rabbit trail for a second? Do I have permission, Jesse? Yes, you'll always give me permission. I know I can count on you to rabbit trail. So here's my rabbit trail. Uh, top 10, one of the top 10 scariest experiences I had, creepiest experiences I had, was just a couple weeks ago. Mary knows where I'm going with this. It is creepy. So I was putting Ari and Riley to bed. They sleep in our basement. They have a room down there, and they sleep great because it's a deep, dark place. Like, who sleeps good in a cool, deep, dark place? I do. Man, just shut off all the lights. I don't need any light. They sleep so well down there. I'm tucking Riley in in the room, and it's very dark, and Aria is finishing her snack upstairs, and she eats like a horse sometimes. I'm sorry, Aria, but it's like the rapper and all. I can hear her upstairs eating. I'm tucking Riley in. I'm like, okay, good night. I love you. I'm praying with her, and as I'm walking out, a little movement out of the corner of my eye. So Riley's over here in her bed and the closet is right here as I'm swinging the door closed. And I see movement, I see a, just a black shadow. And I look and I, it's dark, I can't see. But I just see a black shadow right there. And I'm like, it's moving. There's a big black thing moving. And uh, last time I counted, there's Mary, there's me, there's Riley, there's Arya, there's Caleb. Caleb's in a crib. That is not Caleb. And the black shadow rises from the floor and goes. <sighs> the man of God standing before you right now couldn't run because I was clenched up. <laughs> and in boldness and in faith, I said, Arya, is that you? And she said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I was crouched down for a long time, Daddy. I was hiding. I needed to get some air. I couldn't breathe. And so she rises up going, like that. Top 10 scary, probably top five scariest encounters I've ever had right there next to real demons, okay? That was scary stuff. It was the cat eating her stuff upstairs. So I thought she was upstairs. Man, did that throw me. It was creepy. It was real creepy. And she said, did I scare you? And I was like, no, daddy's fine. Everything. <laughs> Knew it was you the whole time. 
All right, this bright cloud envelops them. I want you to get an understanding that this isn't a normal thing. They weren't just following around Jesus and there was constantly a bright cloud and this voice from heaven speaking. This is wild. It's actually kind of terrifying. It's not normal life stuff. And the glory of God, the weight of God's glory is wonderful and terrible. Who knows what I mean by that? It's wonderful and it's terrible. And they fall down like dead men. And that is not new to the Bible. When people have an encounter with a living God, us sinful people, because we all sin, right? We're not perfect and he is perfect. He exists in unapproachable light, the scripture says. So the glory of God, I mean, Jesus has been transfigured before them and terror sets in with this bright cloud and they fall like dead men in the presence of a righteous and holy God. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And and notice what God finishes with. The father says, listen to him. Listen to him. This is a familiar combination of ideas and phrases. And and for a well-read Jewish man, which I think by this point they might have been, they might have understood the listen to him phrase harkens back to Deuteronomy. You see, Moses, that guy Moses, long before Jesus ever came, Moses prophesied that someone greater than himself was coming from among the people. And here's what Moses said. It's in Deuteronomy 18, 15. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from brothers. Listen to him. Or, or your translation might say it the other way. It is to him that you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see his great fire anymore, lest I die. You see, there was a time when the people of God were approaching, they were getting kind of close to the power and the presence of God, but they were in a sinful place and that was scary to them. And they were like, hey Moses, guess what? You go up the mountain. We don't want to do it. If we get any closer, we're going to die. Are you getting a sense of the righteousness and the purity and the holiness and the power of our holy God? So the people didn't want to approach the mountain. They're like, Moses, you go talk to him. You have that experience. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord or, the God, or, or of my God or see the great fire on the mountain anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what I have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. When this transfiguration experience is happening, it's words like these that are ringing out in their ears. They know they were waiting for someone and the father has just spoken from heaven and said, Guess what? Elijah, Moses, cool, but forget about it. Listen to him. It's all about Jesus, isn't it, church? It's all about Jesus. Also, another thing that might have come to their mind with this bright cloud and the voice that speaks, the words of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 125, it says, Then there came a voice from heaven. This is a a vision that Ezekiel is having. Then then there came a voice from above the vault, above the heads as they stood uh, with lowered wings. Above the vault, over their heads, was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And a high above them was uh, on a throne the figure like that of a man. I saw from that what appeared to be from his waist up, he looked like glowing metal and it was full of fire and then from the waist down, he looked full of fire. A brilliant light surrounded him like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This is what Ezekiel says. This was the appearance, the, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell down and I heard the voice of one speaking. Now do you see some parallels? The Old Testament had examples like this that were pointing forward to the experience the disciples had. There was something powerful paralleling here, but Jesus stands above it all. Jesus is the appearance of the glory of God, amen? And that transfiguration experience was only meant for a few. It was like they got a peek at a forbidden uh, display of the true glory of God. 
There's lots of history in the minds of them, but those words, listen to him, would have stuck out. And then Jesus comes up and touches them on the shoulder and he comforts them. I don't know why, but I just like that part of the story. Jesus comes up and he touches them on the shoulder and he comforts them. I, I just, I know you, I know most of you, not every single one of you, but I know most of you. And I know some of you could really use some comfort right now. But my advice is gonna be the same advice that the Father gave. Listen to him. I really have nothing for you. I don't have a bunch of moral advice. I don't have a TED Talk. I don't have uh, 12 steps to a better life. I don't really have any of that stuff for you. But what I can tell you is that if you will listen to him, you will be comforted. In fact, the scripture is full from front to the back that whether things are good or they are bad, and both of them happen in the life of a believer, right? We don't follow Jesus to make bad life go away because life is still hard. Sin still happens. We still need Jesus every day. His mercies are new. So we we don't follow Jesus to improve our life or get rich or just be healthy or something like that. That's all nonsense. That's just not true. Every one of those apostles, except for one, got martyred, and many of the disciples died, some of them sick, some of them poor. Let's keep that in mind. But the best advice I can give you is listen to him. Jesus touches their shoulders and and comforts them. So I think what we need to take from that right there, if I can make a preaching application out of that, is we need to stop worrying so much about the tents in our life and start being more concerned with the teaching that Jesus has for us. Jesus has a way of speaking and being and it transforms the way we see reality, amen? When he speaks to us and when we really receive it, we're not so concerned about the temporary things. And the things that used to have power over us or the people who used to have power over us. We're not so concerned about those things when we focus on the teaching of the good shepherd because we trust him. You see, trust is an essential component of every relationship. And if we don't have the trust to follow the teachings of Jesus, we, stand, we start, start to worry. We start to, to try to control things ourselves. And how do we do when we do that, guys? When we try to control things, how does it go? Not so well, no, it usually crashes and burns. I've heard it said that you can't have worship and worry in your mouth at the same time. And the truth is, when you start to worry, you start to worship the thing you're worried about. But if you listen to him, he's gonna get you to focus on his kingdom and the glory of God is gonna transform your mind. You're gonna be focused on a big picture instead of a little pebble. You might not trip over it anymore. Peter, James, and John open their eyes and they don't see the initiator of the old covenant, Moses. They don't see the prophet of the kings, Elijah. They only see Jesus. There's something I love about who Jesus is. And you see a little bit of an archetype in King David in the Old Testament, but Jesus is the only one who can wear the title of prophet, priest, and king all at once. And especially in this experience, we see how he is the fulfillment. He's the fullness of all that God had and that no human alone can replace him. No prophet, no good teacher can replace him. Do you guys understand? Jesus is unique. He is completely unique. There is nobody like him. Jesus is not just among good teachers. Jesus is the Son of God. That's why Peter got praised by Jesus. He said, "Uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter but it's the Father in heaven. There is something unique about Jesus and it is that his identity is that he's God. He's not just another good teacher. But they only see him, the prophet, the priest, the king. And this is why I started today by saying, I pray that the church of America will fall down like dead men and rise to only see Jesus to listen to him. That is my desire for this church and every other church in our city. So let's go back. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, some of you who are standing here are not gonna taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Guess what chapter 17 is? It's the Son of Man coming in the glory of his Father, the glory of the kingdom. It's amazing how Jesus put this together. You see, it was a sign, it was a display of the glory of God coming through his son, Jesus. 
And remember where this happened. This is the part that used to give me goosebumps when I would think about it. You ever get like the little goosebumps and it might be spiritual, might not, I don't know. But I would get little goosebumps when I read this part of the story thinking about where it happened. It didn't happen at the temple in Jerusalem. It wasn't at the temple where he could be like, yep, that's mine. Yep, the temple, that's my house, my dad's house. It happened at the enemy's camp. At the top of the hill where the enemy's supposed to be in charge. And he's there at the top saying, actually, It's me. Once again, showing he's the king of the world. Well, that was a good passage, isn't it? I really love that one. Uh, Let me just challenge the church. Let's begin to see the glory of God in deeper ways, whether you're in a low place or in a high place. This mix of Matthew chapter 16 to 17 is really bizarre because Jesus says things about victory and he talks about the, the impending kingdom and then he talks about his death and he puts all these things together and it's like the good and the bad, the low place and the high place are all right there in these two chapters. In your life, you might have a week like that where you're in the low place, you're at the gates of Hades, it feels like hell and then you might have a moment where you're at the top and you're like, man, I'm on cloud nine right now. But you need to understand that Jesus is doing all this, he's saying all this, knowing it's heading to the cross. It doesn't stop him to proclaim his victory. It doesn't stop him from saying, I'm the king of kings and transfiguring before them. And you know what I think? They had a special moment of realizing who Jesus is. They saw more of him, but how much better off are we, the New Testament church, because we know the resurrection and the power of the resurrection. We know not just how Jesus was transfigured, but how we are transformed through the resurrection and the power of Jesus. Amen? I don't know, church, I don't know if God is growing your your roots deeper through trials or if he's building you up through successes when you follow him. I don't know where you're at this week, but both are baked into the cake. I need you to understand the scripture promises nothing less. Low times and high times are baked into the cake. You are going to get both, even if you're a faithful believer. In fact, if you're a faithful believer, I believe that Satan wants to stop you. Don't be surprised when opposition comes. It always breaks my heart when a believer has been faithful, especially a new believer. They've been faithful. They've been following God. They've been giving them their whole heart. And then opposition comes and they're like, well, what is this all about? I'm like, this is the battle. This is what we expected that Satan does want to stop us. He is the opposer. So don't be surprised when he opposes. So verse 9, we didn't get to verse 9, but verse 9, Jesus was about to head down the mountain to go do some king stuff. But just a few chapters later, we'll get to it around Easter time, Resurrection Sunday, humanity is going to put a crown on his head and they're going to put the king on a cross. It's an amazing, amazing dichotomy of highs and lows through these chapters. But it's going to peak at Resurrection Sunday. Can I encourage you, church, would you make sure you are here, bring your family here on uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, be here and invite someone. Would you trust me as your pastor that I am going to present the gospel, I'm going to do my best that I can not to blow people out of the water or scare them away, but let's give them a chance to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus, that we get to see the transform the, the transforming uh, power of his resurrection in our own life and in the gospel. Does that sound good? Let's look forward to that. Would you stand to your feet with me?